Welcome everyone to our very first discussion of the doctrines and teachings of the Book of Mormon. We are all from the Department of Ancient Scripture. We have Brad Farnsworth, Joseph Spencer, George Pierce, and my name is Sean Hopkin, and we're thrilled to be with you today. We were talking before we started today, and, and Joe mentioned something fascinating that he does with his class at the beginning of the semester, just before they're going to study the title page. I think you said you asked the question, uh, what is the Book of Mormon? And then they write, they, they stop and write that, and then uh, what, what do you do after that, Joe? Yeah, then we just start reading the title page and have them compare what they've written and see the gap <laughs> right between our everyday conception and how the title page discusses the Book of Mormon itself. So you might think, well, why do we spend so much time, why are we going to spend so much time today paying attention to these two paragraphs? It's because they were intended to structure the way, to guide us in the way we read the text. Uh, could, do you know what's on the title page without thinking about it first? Do you know how uh, the, the prophets are hoping that you read this text? And so that's what we're going to be doing today is exploring those things. And hopefully there will be some new insights and some new guidance that comes to you. So I think the way we want to start our discussion today um, is Joseph Smith had made a statement uh, about how the way he views uh, the title page. And so, so let's just start with a statement from the prophet Joseph Smith. George? The prophet Joseph said, I wish to mention here that the title page of the Book of Mormon is a literal translation taken from the very last leaf on the left-hand side of the collection or book of plates, which contained the record which has been translated, the language of the whole running the same as all Hebrew writing in general, that is from right to left. And that said title page is not by any means a modern composition, either of mine or of any other man who has lived or does live in this generation. So what I'm getting from that is that Joseph Smith is saying, I did not write this thing. I, this was on the plates. I translated it. Uh, and he, he's describing the plates as reading from right to left. So he's describing some kind of a Semitic ancient uh, language that reads a different direction than English. And that then it's found at the end, which is sort of interesting. Moroni, uh, I think is what he's saying, put this at the end after the entire work was done to structure our reading of the text. And, and Joseph Smith then put it at the beginning as the intro, right? I think any of the other authors, including if it's Joseph Smith, who's writing this or composing it. I think that statement later on in the second paragraph, which we'll cover about the book of Ether, that relationship between Ether and Moroni really comes out here. And I'm not sure if Joseph, if he's composing this, would catch that as prominently as Moroni does, as we want to think about that. So it's very Moroni perspective heavy. Well, and another thing maybe that bears saying here at the beginning of our discussion of the entire Book of Mormon that, that Joe is mentioning is there are different perspectives presented in the Book of Mormon. Sometimes we read it as a gospel doctrine, you know, gospel principles manual. There's just one view, and there is a lot of cohesiveness, right? They did that purposefully. They're, they're, those themes play through, but to see different individuals approaching things a little bit differently and having different things that they cared about depending on their point in history and, and what they're seeing. I think that there's real value in reading the Book of Mormon that way. All right, well, let's keep going. We're, we're just going to read through this, I think, and comment on it as we go. And uh, Brad, maybe you could kick us off here. The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. Wherefore, it is an abridgment of the record of the people of Nephi and also of the Lamanites, written to the Lamanites, who are a remnant of the house of Israel and also to Jew and Gentile. One of the things I've appreciated uh, as I've read some of the work Joe's done with the Book of Mormon is he pays attention to the Lamanites, right? This is sort of an outsider group. The Nephites are the main group, but uh, they, they cared very much. God cared very much prophetically. They, they were paying attention to the needs of the Lamanites and sometimes speaking against the challenges in their own culture uh, and, and, and sort of saying, we, we can't ignore the needs here. And, and so it comes all the way to, and here we are often, uh, just speaking of myself, I'm often doing the same thing myself, ignoring the needs and just focusing it all in on me. And there's some value to that. That's okay, right? It was written for me, but to recognize, well, there's another people that that this record was designed for, and what am I doing for them? You know, as you reflect upon a lot of scriptures, 
many scriptures are revelations to a specific individual, and yet we benefit from that as the reader. In the same way, our, this record is for the Lamanites, and yet we benefit. It's written for us as well. So I, I, it's for Jew and Gentile. It's for all of us. Let me learn about our role, too. I'm, as non-Lamanite, I can see myself in the prophecies of Isaiah that Nephi and Jacob quote, what I should be doing to help further the work, to bring this work to the remnants of Nephi's seed, to the Lamanites, to the rest of the house of Lehi. There's something great in it in which it speaks to me on that level if I think about this is written for me as, a, as an outsider. I'm not a Lamanite, but there's still work here within this that can be accomplished and I can have a role in that. I think you see them doing this early in the history of the church, right? They, they're reading it as for them, and they are also very actively, very aggressively, if that's the right word, but, but they're spending a lot of effort to take this record to, the, to this audience here. It's really beautiful to see. Okay, so let's keep reading. Uh, Joe, maybe you could take sure. over from there. Written by way of commandment, and also by the spirit of prophecy and of revelation, written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord that they might not be destroyed, to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof, sealed by the hand of Moroni, and hid up unto the Lord to come forth in due time by way of the Gentile, the interpretation thereof by the gift of God. One of the things I can, I can comment on with this and it strikes me is the fact that the first couplet there says, written by way of commandment and also by spirit of prophecy and revelation. We see early on in the Book of Mormon that the commandment is given to Nephi to keep a record. And we see that commandment continue on. Take the record, keep the record. From Alma to Helaman, from Amaron to Mormon, from Mormon to Moroni. And, and this is what we have. So it's commandment. But it's not just commandment in the sense of keep a record. It's not a travelogue. It's not a diary. It's not being commissioned by somebody for a different purpose as we want to think about Luke, Acts, and the history of the church. It's written by a spirit of prophecy and of revelation. Nephi, Jacob, Enos, all of them, Mormon and Moroni, need to have the spirit of prophecy and of revelation in order to keep the record and know what needs to be kept, especially Mormon as he's abridging the records together, has to know what's important and have the vision for this record and who it's going to. And so that spirit of prophecy and revelation is, is important there as well. And Mormon and Moroni have seen our day. President Benson has stated that as well as Moroni himself in, in Mormon chapter 8. Uh, they have seen our day, and they're writing this for the modern generation, for us in this, these latter days. A little phrase here that, I, uh, that um, you've been mentioning, but I think is really important then as it's coming forth, because it, there's coming forth language here, coming forth by the gift and power of God. So you think of it coming out of the ground by the power of God, but you also think of this translation process unto the interpretation thereof is the way that it, it reads there. How is this being translated? This is not a typical translation where you've got one record and then you look up, oh, I, I, that word, then you look it up in a dictionary somewhere and you figure out what phrase is going. This is by the gift and power of God. And then I might even broaden it just a little bit further. The gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof. I, I hear that speaking to me now. It's coming forth in my life and its interpretation works when it's done by the gift and power of God. Not just as an academic or an intellectual pursuit, but as a, uh, an inspired, a divinely inspired pursuit. So. And there's the individual gift of the Holy Ghost as each reader is tutored by the Holy Ghost as he or she reads these passages mm -hmm. unto the interpretation thereof. That's great. Yeah. I'm struck by the language of the Gentile coming back in at this moment for this reason, right? It comes forth in due time by way of the Gentile. Uh, there's some role that Gentiles in general, I mean, I, I take that as a, a sort of reference to Joseph Smith directly, right? He's the Gentile by whom this comes forth. But if you read that more generally, there's some role that the Gentiles, non-Lamanites, have, uh, have played in bringing this forth and spreading it throughout the world. Um, I hope it's not arrogant to think that even Book of Mormon scholarship and things like this are a part of that, right, of helping yeah. this book yeah. to come forth as broadly, as widely, as available as possible. I think Nephi would agree with you. I mean, First Nephi 22, he talks about that, interpreting this means by which his seed are going to be ministered to. And so the record that they're keeping, the Gentiles are not only going to preserve and to foster the record of the Jews and bring that record to Nephi's people and the Lamanites as well, but the Gentiles are also going to play the most significant role in bringing forth 
the Nephi record back to Nephi's seed and back to the Lamanites. And as we see in, in 1 Nephi, this is the commencement, the coming forth of this book is the commencement of that marvelous work and wonder that the Lord's going to accomplish in gathering those people back together. Yeah, I think that's important. Okay, so Joe, I, I wonder, uh, maybe here, could you comment a little bit on the title page, uh, the 1830? So you talked about Joseph Smith bringing this for the, the hand of the Gentile. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's an interesting thing here going on with the 1830 title page. Yeah, it's interesting. The 1830 title page, uh, so when it's... Uh, it's, this is actually presented as the title page of the book at the time, right? There isn't the other sort of beginning front matter stuff that we have now. Uh, there's just a brief preface in addition to this. Um, and, uh, and there at the bottom of it, it says, by Joseph Smith Jr., author and proprietor, which is the language of copyright in the day. Uh, but uh, in the 1840 text, um, so this is the, the third edition of the Book of Mormon, published in Nauvoo, uh, that's not there on the title page, and at the bottom it just says Moroni. <laughs> uh, so they actually just inserted this, like, let's make clear who's writing this title page. This is Moroni, um, which is really quite interesting. Could I make a comment? Uh, this phrase, sealed by the hand of Moroni. That's how Moroni closes his record. If you go to chapter 10 of Moroni, he says, I seal up these records after I have spoken a few words by way of exhortation unto you. That's the same Moroni that hundreds of years later, after he seals up this record, then he appears to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1823 and begins the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we understand this role that Moroni has. The Lord says, Moroni, whom I have sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. When we talk about keys, we're talking about order in the, in the Lord's kingdom. And a bishop has keys, a stake president has keys. Moroni has the keys of the record of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, he's got to unlock what he has sealed, right? A really That's a nice way, way to say it. It's yeah. a nice way to say it. And so it transcends generations and even dispensations, this great prophet Moroni. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let, let's keep reading. George, you, you okay taking us uh, from here at the beginning of the second paragraph? Let's just sort of read to that first dash maybe. An abridgment taken from the book of Ether also, which is a record of the people of Jared, who were scattered at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven. Okay, so I'll just briefly say here this, this little... Aside is interesting. Moroni has worked really hard to get us this record, and, and he, I think he wants to make sure we recognize it's important. But if you look at what's coming up, the reminder of the covenants, I mean, this people doesn't make it, right? So their message is important. I don't think Moroni sees them in quite the same covenant line as the House of Israel. Of course, they, they're prior to the House of Israel, so to speak. Um, but, but their message fits the rest of the messages of the Book of Mormon. So I see this as, uh, it, it's sort of appropriately placed here to say this is part of the message, even though this is a little bit of a different focus or a different line than what we've got going. I don't know if any of you read it differently than that. I mean, one thing that strikes me, I mean, I, when you read the title page, it, this little bit of it feels excessive or out of place or something, right? That we don't even get a summary of the Nephite history, but we get a summary here of the Jaredite history in a way, in more detail uh, than, than we do with the Nephite. So it seems kind of strange. Uh, I guess I have two thoughts about that. The first one is that it's striking that although the Book of Ether is for us a very short book, uh, when Moroni was done, it was extremely long. The sealed portion of the Book of Mormon is the vision of the brother of Jared. So when he says the book of Ether is in here and this record of the Jaredites, he's thinking two-thirds plus <laughs> of, the, of this book I'm sealing up. Uh, so there's some sense maybe in which this looms larger for him than it does for us without the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. But the other thing that strikes me is that um, there's some sense in which the book of Ether does a nice job at highlighting the covenants because here you have a people who aren't Israelites uh, and their history ends with them eradicated. There's no remnant. There's no promise uh, for them if they haven't repented. Uh, and so there's some sense in which here's a strong message for Gentile readers. The covenants are what preserve a people into the last days so that promises can be fulfilled. Gentiles, there's a warning here. And the Book of Mormon does seem to dig into that message that Gentiles, you need to be brought into this 
covenant lineage, right? Numbered among is the no, language. Yeah, we'll right, we'll right, yeah. yeah. In his talk, Beware of Pride, President Benton reminds us that perhaps one of the reasons of the Book of Ether is a second witness of what will happen to a civilization if they don't overcome pride. Of course, the Nephite civilization is the first. So you have these two witnesses in the Book of Mormon telling us in the latter days, we must overcome pride, and President Benson with passion says, and we will, we will, we must. I invite you to do this. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful discourse from a living prophet. So George, how would you feel about continuing to read there from that first dash to the next dash then, sure. which is? which is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. Oh, this is so rich, right? Uh, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this is anticipating a little bit, but we're going to get further purposes, as we call them here on the title page of the Book of Mormon. Uh, but they're divided up into two chunks, if you will. And the first one focuses on the first audience from the first paragraph. And the next one, next chunk will focus on the second, or the secondary audience, right? Here we're talking about the remnant of the house of Israel. Then in the next line, it'll be talking about Jew and Gentile. And so as it starts with, here's the, what the primary audience is supposed to get from this. It is about what God has been doing for their fathers, right? So. And it's clear that, that that remnant of the house of Israel that he says here in the second paragraph is tied back to the Lamanites, because that's the exact same phrase exactly. that he uses in yeah. the first paragraph. Exactly. There are... Right, to show unto, and you can even insert it, to show unto the Lamanites, the remnant of the house of Israel, what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers. Exactly. And one of the purposes of having ether in there is to show, listen, here's a contrast. The contrast. This is what the Lord did for the, for the Jaredites. But look what the Lord did for your fathers and everything else. You've with been the preserved. Yeah. You've been preserved. It's a great statement. In fact, that's one of the great exhortations of Moroni as he finishes Moroni 10. What does he say? He says, and I would that you would remember all the way back to the days of Adam, yeah. all the things the Lord has done for man. Say, once again, it's that we're one family, mankind, children of God. Yeah. You, you sort of have a shift here where he's beginning to talk about here are the purposes in a focused way and one of the words that we've already been highlighting that we need to make sure uh, is pointed out clearly is this covenants to, to recognize the covenants. There is, this is very biblical, there's a way of reading the Bible and I think it's pretty clearly there in the, the Hebrew Bible, the, the, what Christians call the Old Testament, to read it as the record of a covenant and then that, that becomes the new covenant, so to speak, in the New Testament, right? Uh, and, and, and you can see it first overtly with Noah, but then if you go back you see covenantal language and uh, behaviors and attitudes going on all the way from the creation and the fall and, and it just becomes this record of this continued covenant relationship between God and man, between God and the earth uh, and, and that, so there's this focus later in on later on in on the house of Israel but early on it, this is with this is with everyone and God is is entering into a relationship with his creation and to see this playing out in the book of Mormon there is power because of the covenants I think is is crucial and to see Moroni here he is so many centuries separated from a biblical culture and yet his understanding flows from it. And, and one other word I want to mention is that remnant word that Joe, you talked about. Um, they love Isaiah, don't they? Yes. And, and this is very Isaianic, this, this remnant word. Isaiah is constantly talking about a remnant, a righteous remnant. A remnant will be preserved. Uh, and to see them reading Isaiah here still, at least is the way I see it, on the title page, right at the very tail end, Isaiah is still important to them and helping them understand their history. I mean, the, the Moroni 10, what is it? 30 and 31, mm -hmm. I mean, we're right. four or five verses from the end of the Book of Mormon, and he's weaving Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 54 together, and yeah, Isaiah's right up to the end. So, we've been talking about moving into the purposes of the Book of Mormon. We've talked about to show them what great things the Lord God hath done for their fathers, and we've talked about the covenants. Brad, would you now take the next section and read that for us, starting with and also? Sure. And also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. I love this word convincing. Uh, convincing is, is removing doubt. It's more than testifying. It's more than teaching the gospel. 
it's convincing of the Jew and Gentile. When we say Jew and Gentile, as Nephi defines it for us, the Jew are those who are from the region of Jerusalem, not just the tribe of Judah, but like Nephi. Nephi considers himself to be a Jew. The Gentiles would be everyone else. And so Jew and Gentile, he's saying the convincing of all of the children of God that Jesus is the Christ. What a, what a wonderful purpose that the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. It's interesting also that as we've talked about the purposes in the title page, there are other scriptures that also mention some purposes. For example, Moroni in Ether 4 says that one of the purposes of the Book of Mormon is to be a sign that the work of the Father has commenced. And then the prophecy of Joseph of Egypt in 2 Nephi chapter 3, that the Book of Mormon and the Bible together will bring the confounding of false doctrines in the latter days. Nephi's vision talks about how the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to restore plain and precious things which have been taken away from the records of the apostles of the Lamb. And even in modern day revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord himself says the Book of Mormon proves to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true, that the Holy Bible is true, and that God does inspire men and call them to his holy work in this age and generation. The Book of Mormon is that purposeful that the Lord himself is reminding us of that it is part of the gathering of Israel in the latter days in many, many ways. Um, I want to highlight one phrase there, and that's manifesting himself unto all nations. And we often read this line and focus on it, talking about Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, which is fantastic. Uh, but the, that extra qualifier that Moroni adds, that Jesus manifests himself unto all nations, uh, there's some sense in which if you have just the Bible alone or the biblical perspective, uh, the Messiah comes at one point in history uh, to one very determinate people in one determinate region, and here the Book of Mormon sort of explodes that. He comes to ancient America and, in fact, to all nations. The paragraph opens with the Jaredites. He came to the brother of Jared. He came to this totally non-Israelite people. Um, there's uh, some sense in which part of what the Book of Mormon is doing is showing us how much bigger Jesus' story is than the story we can read into biblical texts. Okay. So, let's uh, now read this final phrase. Uh, George, you okay reading this for sure. us? Sure. that be all right? And now, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, that you may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. One of the things that I like about this statement is, is Moroni says, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. We're very clearly seeing Moroni, and Moroni's concept or self-awareness of, of what he's doing with the record that parallels something that we see later on or in the Book of Mormon, Mormon chapter 9, in which Moroni is, is very clearly aware that he's at a disadvantage. The language that he's writing in is not the language that he's speaking, and he feels that that's hampering the way in which he can describe what's going on and be able to convey this record. And we have that later on in, in the Book of Mormon, Moroni section as well, as he talks about this. And so Moroni is clear to point out that they're the faults, then they're the mistakes of men. And he says this in, in Mormon chapter 9, in which he talks about the fact he says, Behold, I speak unto you as though I spake from the dead, for I know that ye shall have my words. Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, neither them who have written before him, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. And so Moroni in this self-awareness knows that his language is, is faulty. He knows that even his father is a human being who sometimes makes mistakes. The other writers sometimes make mistakes, but if there's anything that we're going to learn, it's going to, we're going to learn from them about God's work and, and what he's doing. So I think it's a, it's a great statement there that he brings in. I'd, I'd sort of like to hear someone respond to the question, why is this meaningful for you? What, what does this title page do for you? Why, why is it just not an afterthought for you in your study of the Book of Mormon? I like it as a focus so that as we go through all the detail of the narratives and all of the necessary information so that we can appreciate these people that are, that are living the gospel, that this helps us focus on what Moroni says, but remember the covenants. 
Remember the purposes of the Book of Mormon. Remember, the, remember that Jesus is the Christ. And so we see that. One of the things that we had our missionaries do in Spain was that we had them read the entire Book of Mormon and circle every verse that had to do with Jesus Christ. And one by one they re would report back and say, almost every page it talks about the Savior. And that's what Moroni is inviting us to do is remember to focus on the Savior as you, as you go through all of the detail of the civilizations. And this is about the Savior. There's a very famous talk everyone here is familiar with uh, by J. Reuben Clark uh, on the charted course of the church and education. Uh, and in it, he talks about latitude and longitude, so you know where you're at. Um, and one thing that the title page does for me constantly is it, there's some sense in which it gives me my bearings. It gives us a set of purposes for the Book of Mormon. And if you line them up, you get a kind of latitude and a longitude. Jesus is the Christ, this covenant that God has made with Israel. Uh, in some sense, there's my latitude, my longitude. I've got myself on a GPS. I know where I'm at in any moment in the Book of Mormon. Where are we at with these covenants that go back into antiquity? Where am I at with Christ? Uh, so there's some sense in which it keeps me centered, focused, and know where I'm at. I think it gives me a sense of God's purpose and God's power. He commanded that the record be written. He preserved the record through all of the Nephite troubles and everything that are going on in the conflict with the Lamanites to the point that Moroni and Mormon know that the record is going to go to the Lamanites and that we can see his purposes. But even more than that, it's not just for the Lamanites, it's going to be left for them to find. We see even Nephi knows that the Gentiles are going to bring this thing forth, and it is going to commence this marvelous work and wonder of bringing everyone, the house of, of God, back together, and that he can be glorified in that, and that Jesus is the means by which all that's brought together. And I think that's a a great takeaway from reading the title page. Well, so why don't we stop at that point in our discussion and conclude. We want to thank you all warmly for joining in on our discussion today. Let's leave you with a final challenge, the same challenge that I think we feel as we read the title page, and that is for you to, to use Moroni's concluding slash opening remarks here to guide your exploration of the Book of Mormon and to dig into the text in the ways he's guiding you to do and to see how that shifts and changes your reading of the text as you move forward. Mm -hmm.